millones de personas mueren por consumir agua no apta para el consumo humano. Esta es una ciudad, quizás tenemos 14 personas. 但是有三亿人是有这个心血管疾病啊，或者有有这个三高啊。Without the intimacy of human connection to the planet, we're really looking for trouble. We have a food system that's that's actually killing us. On the moment you make contact with nature, you think differently. By 2050, I envision a nation who are proud to feed and sustain their families. The future is in the hands of the people. The question is, are you going to be a part of it, or will you sit back and watch it happen? session we're going to be digging into data um, and I can't think of a better person to be talking to us about this than Sarah Manker is the founder and CEO of Grow Intelligence so thank you for being with us I think you just flew in <laughs> this morning uh, but before we dig into the data I want to dig into your story um, you grew up in Ethiopia in the 80s around a lot of hunger and famine surrounding you and through a lot of hard work, sacrifice with your family, came to study in the US and then became a commodities trader on Wall Street, um, which then you left <laughs> to start Grow Intelligence. So I wanna hear a little bit about that path and that story and how your lived experience led you to developing this company and this approach and what sparked this career change for you? Yeah, um, I mean, I always say I fell into commodities trading. I didn't really plan to become one. <laughs> that was an accident. And I, you know, I, as you said, I grew up in Ethiopia, so I came here for college. And, um, you know, when, especially back then when you were graduating, actually very few places um, sponsored visas. Mm -hmm. So Wall Street was one of the few places that did. You went into consulting. So it was, it was almost like just out of, uh, necessity, but I had interned and realized um, during my sort of internship that um, the only thing that made to me in finance was at least things sort of associated with physical goods, which were commodities. Um, and, you know, I did that and I went into energy trading though. So I was not in, in agriculture. I was a natural gas trader. Now it's very relevant <laughs> to my life again in different ways, but um, I, you know, I think it was one of those jobs, like I said, I fell into. I was good at it. I really liked the people I work with, but I realized I just didn't have a passion for it about eight years in. Um, and I think part of it was because um, when the 08, 09 financial crisis happened, uh, I mean, really what happened was the guy next to me thought the world was coming to an end. And he decided that the best hedge to the world coming to an end was buying um, as much guns and gold as possible. Um, and I remember thinking, I, I said to him one day, I was like, what are you gonna do, like eat gold? Like what are you <laughs> gonna feel like if the world comes to an end? Are you gonna trade gold for a sack of potatoes? And it was actually originally despite him that I looked at investing in agriculture and I said, I'm gonna get a piece of land, I'm gonna grow some potatoes, I'm gonna give it to you. You're gonna see how horrible an idea you have. But also, I think fundamentally, I think there was just a mismatch between Morgan Stanley stock going to zero would 
which would suck, but was nowhere close to the end of the world. And I think having grown up in the 80s in Ethiopia were much, no matter who you were, everything was limited. Fuel was rationed, uh, sugar was rationed, you know, this, this idea of abundance just didn't exist. Um, and I think that, I, that that was sort of fundamentally where this mismatch sort of existed, but I did get obsessed with this idea of buying land, and, and I thought to myself, well, my family still lives in Ethiopia, I should buy land in Africa, uh, because Africa has the world's largest amount of arable land that's unused, it's cheap, this has got to work, at least as an investment. And I went down the path of actually seriously looking at starting essentially a commercial farming operation in Ethiopia, um, had lined up a bunch of people I knew in the commodities market as like this great opportunity and it's, you know, 100 year leases were available for a dollar an acre and you could get like 100,000 acres if you wanted as a, as a way of sort of investing in, in farmland. And by the time I finished doing the math on what it would actually take to make it work, it was just cheaper to buy land in Iowa. Wow. And to me, that fundamentally made me, one, realize buying that land was not gonna be a good idea, but two, like as an investment, but two, that farming was just so much harder in Sub-Saharan Africa than people were making it out to be, and the cost of land and the arability of the land is just not a necessary condition. It was sort of all the breaks that you had in the supply chain that were making it impossible. And so, you know, four years of just asking lots of questions of why, and every time I asked why, somebody gave me information, it was two years old, and then I would be like, well, where is it today? And nobody would give me anything that made sense. Everything just seemed so outdated. And, you know, in the energy world and in sort of the market I traded in natural gas, I mean, we scraped every pipeline every single day to get a sense for what the supply was and what the demand was, and that drove the price. And the ability to be able to understand our system inside and out 24 seven was what made us make really good financial decisions, but also fund long-term projects in sort of the energy markets. And I just had a moment where I realized, like I said, I was good at my job, but I had no passion. Um, that it was clear that there was no way we were gonna solve anything around food security if we didn't understand the system itself. And there, it was clear that very little work had been done to sort of systematically do it in the way that we were doing it in the financial markets. And I sort of left to, to do that. So let's talk a little bit about Grow intelligence and how you're using AI machine learning to help give you know real-time data and help improve some of these systems challenges. Can you give some examples of how that works in practice? Yeah, so I always say it was great. I was very naive at how difficult it was gonna be <laughs> to do it in agriculture relative to energy. And the reason I, I say that is, you know, oil is oil, natural gas is natural gas. The way you produce it is kind of the same. Uh, production is actually highly concentrated because it's expensive to produce, it's highly regulated. So because of all that, the, the way in which information around it is stored, even if, even back when we were sort of doing it, it was fragmented, was significantly less fragmented than what agriculture was gonna mean. In the sense that, first of all, agriculture is not a product, it's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of different products. Each one has a different set of biological rules that govern how that plant or that animal grows. And um, you can grow it and you can have a half acre farm or you can have a 100,000 acre farm. And um, demand is sort of dispersed down to sort of individuals like us and what we consume. And so uh, data around sort of our food systems and agriculture is fragmented in that way. The best data in every country tends to come in a different format, in a local language. I mean, you know, the best data from Brazil Yes, there's plenty that comes out in English, but the Portuguese versions always have more depth, more breadth, um, and so by the time you multiply it by a number of languages, uh, every place reports in its own format, PDF files, whatever, and so the first thing we had to build was an engine that could take data in any format and in any language. So that was the first, the first sort of challenge we had to solve was how is it that we're gonna build a pipeline of data where we can take, today we're ingesting data from over 50,000 sources around the world, but it was how do you do that, and then how do you do automated language translation that is context specific in agriculture, 
um, very, the automatic translation actually fails, and that's where we have to bring in domain experts initially. It's about human intelligence and making sure you have people who know how to interpret that information to then sort of work with engineering teams to train it. Once we've solved the ingestion problem, then it's like you have too much data, but there's also lots of gaps and the lags still exist. So we then had to create a space to essentially fill data gaps. Where's cropland for particular crops? Um, what are the yields today, not two years ago? You know, those types of challenges. Um, and so we went through this sort of data generation journey and um, developed 28 modeling frameworks. So think of a modeling framework as something that is broad in its definition of what it solves for. So uh, a yield forecast model, a protein demand forecast model, a climate index, a food price index. Those 28 modeling frameworks today generate about 16,500 unique data sets for us. Now think of a unique data set as that yield forecast model becomes specific to a crop because corn grows differently than soybeans, than palm, et cetera, or Climate index means nothing unless you break it down to drought or flood or tropical cyclone, et cetera. Those 16,500 data sets actually now generate 2 million unique model outputs for us every day. And so that's really where you, know, you use AI on sort of multiple levels. The first is just in the mapping of information, like literally just organizing it, mapping it. The second is in sort of the construction, the model construction process. And then the third is actually connecting those models to give insight which is really what you wanna do. You wanna move from a journey of having discrete data and converting that data into knowledge. And we had um, Roy Steiner on the stage earlier from Rockefeller Foundation, and you have a collaboration with them to make some of this real-time data available publicly. I think it was in 49 African countries, showing demand of corn, soy, wheat, rice. Um, so how is this really helping to empower local farmers, and what are some maybe success stories of how this can really impact change on the ground? I think the way to think about it, uh, is a slideshow? Okay. The way to think about it, I'm just bringing up some slides and I'm actually gonna have a screenshot of the um, Africa food security tracker here too, but you know, when you think about impact, and you think about impact on the farmer, you have to think about impact on the system, and whether, you know, because the assumption that we as a world actually understand the system is fundamentally flawed. And this, this map is a, is, you know, it's a simple map. It just is showing the extent of the food inflation problem we have around the world today. This is simply looking at a basket of agricultural products on a local currency basis and the price moves experienced from 2020, the beginning of 2020 to today. You will see that no part of the world is immune to food price shocks, right? The US up 67%. A place like Sudan is up almost 2,000% in prices, Syria 700%. Um, the EU is 85%. So the combination of food price increases plus um, the strength in the dollar has led to a pretty seismic shift, right? And so the first thing about sort of impacting farmers is understanding the, the context they live in, right? And I think that's what we do really well is, is much more context setting at a global scale so people can have that understanding to then have more targeted interventions. When need seems so dire around the world, where do you start and how do you sort of take action, right? So I think when we, when we built the tracker with um, the Rockefeller Foundation, this is just, this is another way of looking at the map, it's the top 20 countries, you'll see if you look at the top 20, and you pretty much. use this as a predictive tool, so you see you know, Sudan up in, and to, to then let people target their programs knowing that this is coming, right? Well, this is not just this is coming, this is what's happened. Yeah. <laughs> so the next part is then what's coming, yeah. right? So it, again, like where are we coming from to where are we going? Like both the history matters to the projection mm -hmm. Um, and the contextualization matters. And in this case, it's, it's just much more to make a point that you have everyone from Sudan to Norway on a top 20 list. When's the last time we've ever seen this as a world, right? And I think that itself is really important context to have. Then when you start to think about projecting into the future, that's when you're using analytical layers to actually say, how can we predict, and in this case what we did is we built yield forecast models for 
um, for corn, for rice, for soybeans, and for wheat, for every district for 49 countries across Africa every day. What does that allow us to do? By having a forecast model on those sort of statistics, all of a sudden you're able to estimate how much inventory is approximately available in each country. Now if you have a stocks to use ratio, which is how much inventory relative to how much demand, that simple ratio, it's, it's just a simple division, but the back end of how much of each crop there is is actually quite a complex set of calculations, now lets you see how can we rank the African countries based on who is lowest on what type of inventory. Again, when you go back to how does this impact farmers, policy. <laughs> it will impact farmers from a you know, standpoint of, or, or not you just, it's not even just farmers, it's society in terms of how do you do targeted aid intervention? Um, where is that gonna be needed? So as opposed to being reactive, because this is predicting end of season, so really it's, it's as the, the season is ongoing, instead of reacting after something is a disaster, how do you actually proactively at least plan, right? Like, it's, it's sort of the world, the way I describe it is, you know, in medicine there's reactive and there's preventative medicine. And, and I think in our food systems we're largely in the reactive space and it's sort of moving it into the preventative space. So I want to talk a little bit about how um, data can break up some of the power structures. I mean, so we know there's plenty of food in the world to feed everyone, um, but it's our system that fails and those with the power to have access to the food um, but data can also be powerful. So how do you think about your tools and data in helping to redistribute that power within our food system? Yeah, I mean, that was really central to our mission from when we started and why I used to get so angry every time said, everybody said, you know, you're trying to be a Bloomberg for agriculture. I'm like, no, Bloomberg only cares about the financial markets. We care about the world. Like, very different things. Um, and so we had to embed in our business model a thought process which frankly, it was really hard because it had never been tried before, of how do you build a product that you can sell at the right price to the smallest of organizations and, and companies, to the biggest, and price proportionally and appropriately, and how do you also have free versions? Like, how do you open source some of that knowledge? And how do you sort of bring that around the table? And I think for us, that was absolutely critical for a few reasons, right? You know, when I sort of talked about data in the energy markets, when I was trading natural gas, we used to call the natural gas markets Gas Vegas. And that was because you would go to bed and the market would be up like 30%, then like you're in the office, then it's down 30%. It was just all over the place, right? And there was tons of information asymmetry. There was very little liquidity. If you were a volatility trader like myself, you loved it. But it was actually not good for society. And you know, if a producer had come and wanted to sell gas or oil two, three years forward when I first started, that was hard to do. By the time I left, we were doing 10, 20 year forward hedges for them. What did that do? That funded a whole new wave of innovation in the energy markets, which made shale oil, shale gas, you know, sort of fracking as a technology, love it or hate it, drove down the fundamental cost of sort of uh, traditional sort of fossil fuels, Coal you know, became uneconomic largely because of those innovations, but really long-term capital started to flow into energy markets like we'd never seen before. And that similar structural change needs to happen in agriculture and information is sort of that infrastructure necessary. And for that to happen, there has to be a baseline understanding by everyone because actually if very few people have it, then you can't structurally change the markets. It's really hard to do. And so for us, we adopted a few tenants. One was just this idea of having a model that started from free all the way to sort of large enterprise licenses. But the second was also having a level of transparency to our modeling, which was not typical of AI companies. So in 2016, which is when we launched our first forecast model, um, it was U.S. corn, and the reason we did U.S. corn is not because it was the most interesting to model, but because everybody was modeling it, which meant that we could be benchmarked against a lot of people. But it was also at a time when companies were trying to sell those models to hedge funds for hundreds of thousands of dollars, and we decided we'll make it free, we'll publish it every day, and we'll also publish our methodology for industry and academia to review, and use that as a way to sort of start building trust, because 
Now with two million models, you can't do it at that scale, but also it was not about building trust in our ability to model the US, but as you start to model regions like Russia or India or China that have very little data coming out of them frequently enough, that sort of resilience and trust needs to be there. But I, I do think that for us to solve sort of the structural challenges we have around capital markets in our food systems, and that's how we're gonna fund and drive innovation, data is just a form of infrastructure. So for many of those who are in the room uh, here today and joining us online, it might work with an NGO or government, civil society, an advocacy group, how do you see a technology business like yours fitting into that ecosystem? And how do you think the people here could leverage the data that you're able to provide and turn that into real action results on the ground? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you have to pick your battles on how many things you can do. <laughs> um, you know, um, in, in our case, the, to answer your, your first question of how do people use it or what can they do to use it, I mean, Literally, the Africa Food Security Tracker is open. Like, you don't even need a login. It's just on the website. You can play with the data. It updates every single week. Um, it's there. We have a fertilizer impact tracker that we partnered with the Gates Foundation on um, that looks at the effects of nitrogen shortages and predicts sort of what calorie um, deficits are going to be um, sort of based on sort of um, uh, different nitrogen scenarios that we sort of did partnerships with. That's open. But again, even our data portal, there is an open version of it. Now, in terms of what to do with it, I mean, I always say you have to choose to be in the data business or in the advice giving business. And we're very carefully not in the advice giving business. We are in the business of empowering people with that knowledge and trusting that you know, everybody will do different things with it, right? And what we do try to do, and, and I think we do a very good job of, is making sure we contextualize it so people can understand what it means. So uh, we are talking about how we can get back on track to zero hunger, SDG2. We have seven years, um, and I think we're going to solve it over the next two days, right, guys? Um, but what do you think needs to happen to actually achieve zero hunger by 2030? And do you see hope in that with the work that you're doing, particularly in Africa? I don't feel very hopeful right now, I have to say. Um, <laughs> And it's not because it's not, it's not sort of just about our work, right? I think the reality is just the last sort of two years, we've taken ourselves back a couple of decades um, and we have to confront that and we have to look at why. Um, and, you know, I just, I remember when 2030 felt like a long ways away, right? Remember, it's like when you set these goals and it seems like, oh, there's lots of time. And, and, and then you realize now, you know, it's, almost 2023, and to your point, it's seven years away. Um, I think there are things we can do around creating better trading mechanisms and systems. Like, the, if there's one thing we've learned over the past few years is how interdependent and like connected our system, our food systems are globally, there's no way we're gonna break that apart. Like it's, it's, it's hard, it's physically impossible for every country to grow what it needs in its own space. And today we're moving towards a world of increasing, you know, protectionist policies, not open policies. Um, so if we could use data, for example, to better understand what the distribution of resources looks like and sort of effectively manage policy in such a way that um, the trading mechanisms function such that those who have something you know, can, can get it and in return get what they need. I mean, when Indonesia imposed um, a ban on palm oil exports, you, you see policies like that and, you know, the implications for Africa are huge because Africa's a huge importer of palm oil. But Indonesia did that, it didn't have a palm oil problem, it had a wheat problem. So you don't ban the export of one thing to, to deal with a problem of another and that's sort of the way our world is functioning. So I guess in some ways I, I think the more we can open up data sets and the more that sort of is staring people in the eye, the more we can hold policymakers accountable for decisions they make. But I, I would love to think that we can get back on track, but. Well, what yeah. keeps you motivated to still keep working towards this goal? I mean, I, 
the flip side, I think people are paying attention. Like I, I say to our team that when I started the company eight years ago, we were working on obscure problems. Today we're working on obvious challenges. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are paying attention. I think what motivates me is that literally people who didn't think this was an important topic are now all motivated to solve it. So I do think we can use this moment to also galvanize a much, much bigger community of people than ever before around these issues. And so how do you use it as a l learning moment to do it? For me, I think what keeps me motivated is I guess I can't see numbers and keep my mouth shut, so. <laughs> okay, well we hope you continue to not keep your <laughs> mouth shut and uh, hoping that we can get a movement going and galvanizing around the room together. So, so thank you so much, Sarah, for your time today. Thank you for right, having thank me. You. <laughs>
Good morning, and thank all of you for joining us uh, this morning and for all of you online. We know how committed you are to this cause, and so thank you for joining us. This is going to be a panel that's going to talk about change makers, as we just heard. But let me just throw out five words that I've heard this morning that I think are crucially important that maybe would be helpful for us to reflect upon as we listen to, to the group here today. Uh, the first one is human dignity. We heard from Roy, we got, have to focus on the human dignity. The second is unity, how we come together to, to respond to this. Subsidiarity, how we make sure that we're reaching the local people and making sure they are the artisans of their own future. And then we just heard trust many times. In development, most important word, people don't trust you, they're not gonna change their behaviors, they're not gonna move forward. And then hope, and you'll hear today about hope on what we can do together to make sure we change the future for the better with hope. Let, let me um, move forward. I'm not gonna go through a long introduction because I'd much rather hear from our panelists what they have to say. You've got the bios uh, either online and you can see where people are from. But I'd like us to, to look a little bit right now on sometimes we think of the food security issue as one that only means in the poorest countries overseas. Um, but I'd like uh, Heber to begin and talk about uh, what he has done in founding the Black Church Food Security Network right here in the United States, just up the road in Baltimore. Heber? Thanks so much, Sean. You know, I was so glad in the previous session we saw that the United States was there as a part of the graphic and as part of the data. It's very important because so many times it can be so easy, as Sean just alluded to, to make food security a situation that impacts others. But here in the US, we have it under control. Now, those of you who pay any kind of attention to these issues, you know very clearly, especially over these past couple of years, that the challenges around food insecurity know our address too. And it's knocking on the doors of every community, uh, no matter your economic realities in your neighborhood or the racial makeup or demographic of your community, it's there. And so it's here in this country as, as well, and it's just as pressing. In fact, some might argue even more pressing for us to really uh, lean in more on the issues around food insecurity because what if some revel revelation or insight or courageous action that we take here ripples in a positive way to our siblings around the world? Through the Black Church Food Security Network, we work with African American churches to organize what they already have in their hands and put it in the direction of addressing food apartheid and food insecurity. We uh, embrace an asset-based community development model that basically we don't start with what's wrong, we start with what's strong. And when it comes to African American churches, they have been anchor institutions in black America for 300 years. For anybody who cares about sustainability, you need to care about black churches because these spaces have been not just uh, places where we come to sing and shout and talk about God and going to heaven one day. But when it comes to the bread and butter issues of how to have dignity and respect and how to organize so that we might have a higher quality of life, African-American churches have been doing that for a very long time. I'll stop here because I feel a sermon coming on, so I'll end, the, end it now. <laughs> One of the temptations that we have is that we individualize mass movements and put it on the shoulders of one person, and that one person is the reason. Let's take Dr. King, for example. But you know, my eyes opened up wide and my understanding around how change happens got more expansive when I realized that no, Dr. King was not some superhero. He was a part of a community that groomed him, shaped him, taught him, and then gave him opportunity as they stood next to him to make the drastic and demanding changes that were needed. And I think this kind of moment is one of those two. When we think about role making and change makers, what if you held up a mirror and said, what if I am the same kind of change maker on this issue or another as others have been on their issues too? Thank you, Heber, and I, and I think we all know as we reflect on the civil rights movement and the work of the black churches there, it was a movement that wasn't just about the black churches, but bringing others in as well, and so that's the together as we move forward. Kate, we, would you jump in and talk a little bit about, we heard from some of the previous uh, speakers 
about how we have enough food around. Why isn't it getting to the people who need it? Why haven't we made as significant progress to date as we would have liked to? Thank you, Sean. And um, before I even do that, you know, just asking ourselves, why are we here today still talking about hunger? Mm. Why are we talking about hunger today? And I heard lots of speakers talking about collaboration. We are doing as much as we can, but we are here. We need to really ask ourselves that question. Because if we, this is not an academic conversation. This is about people that need to be fed. This is about people dying on a day-to-day -day basis. So to your question, I'm going to focus on structures and systems uh, because this is something that is close to my heart, but also uh, as Food for the Hungry, we're also looking at that as much as we should because we've been working with communities for 50 years, over 50 years. We go to communities, we ask them what we need, you know, what, what are your needs and stuff like that. So why are, why are we here? It's because the systems that we operate in, we have, we are shying away from addressing the root causes, which means are we as a, co a, a globally, we have enough food, but wh why are we not getting the food where it should be? That's one. Secondly, we have African countries, other countries globally, and we talk about countries being poor. Are they really poor? Mm. Or is there inequ inequitable distribution of, of resources? Mm. And are we able to go to those countries, to local systems, to local governments, and say, let us distribute our resources equally? We don't do that because, no, it's a sovereign state. We can't touch that. Okay, we, we're trying our best. It's, yeah, yeah, it's a long, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we need to do. We are not, we are not, we are not ready. Let's ask ourselves and challenge ourselves. Are we really doing what we're doing? Or it's good to come and sit here, talk about this, and we'll go and we'll come back and talk about this. So, yes, definitely this is not doom and gloom because here's yes, action against hunger things. We are sitting here and talking. The question is, are we supposed to be in this room asking these questions? Or we should be where the action is? Are we able to go and, and talk to those that we serve, the people that we serve who need dignity? They don't need handouts, they need dignity. Are we able to go there and talk to them? So if we can answer those questions ourselves and say, from a donor perspective, how rigorous are our, how stringent or rigid are our forms of, uh, you know, the way we say we, we access resources? That's one. International NGOs, are we keeping ourselves in jobs? Because it feels good to be going and, and saying, oh, I have a beneficiary. Okay, we've done this bit, this bit. And why am I saying this? These solutions can actually be locally grown in a non-academic way. I'll give you an example of, uh, just quickly I'll finish, give you an example of uh, when I was in Guatemala a year ago. I got to the community, I, I can never pronounce Juan Cabel, something. I went to the community, right? And they were receiving food um, supplements, lentil uh, beans. That's not what they eat. It doesn't test the way they, you know, it doesn't have the spices they need. What did our team do in Guatemala? They then decided to adapt that, adapt that and say, okay, let's have a competition, let's have recipes, let's have a way of making this food palatable for us so that it's no longer just something that we receive externally. What does that do? First, it provides a culture of it's good to eat nutritious food, I can grow it at my, in my garden. Because usually when we come and say we are strengthening communities, they actually, have, they, they've been surviving before we came, right? Mm -hmm. All we need to do is to catalyze, we are catalysts. So just, I'll, I'll stop there because we, we're going to talk about another topic on localization, you know, just focusing on local solutions. But I just want to us to go back and ask ourselves, are we doing enough? Or we say it's expensive. Yeah, how accountable can communities be if we give them resources? So those are questions we should be asking ourselves and ask ourselves, do you want to be here again 50 years later talking in this room about what we can do about hunger or we can do it now? Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I think it's, it's always important uh, when we have some type of event that we're not just talking about things. And 
And I always encourage my colleagues whenever they go out to the field or when they meet with someone to have an ask. So we've already got the ask from Kate here. It's not to just have this discussion in the room, but let's get down uh, out to where the action is happening. But one way, would, would you like to talk a little bit about your experience because you have done some action. You've uh, made the food caucus uh, in the, the Zambian parliament. You've moved some things forward. Could you tell us a little bit about how people can get energized to stimulate change? Yeah, thank you so much, Sean. And I, I think that after listening to Kate and Hiba, it really gets you thinking and suddenly I don't want to say what I plan to say. I have a whole other thing. <laughs> um, I think that the one thing for me that stands out is that we've almost created this falsehood for ourselves that hunger will always exist. And so we sort of sit back and think about this as a situation of an us versus them. We've painted a picture of where hunger exists and the class that brings food to the hungry. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that is sort of this notion that we have to challenge. And as we sit here today, I think Kate has provoked our minds in a really strong way about how do we think about overhauling this entire system that has ensured that this is perpetuated. I think in terms of what we, when we talk about together against hunger, it's really about that word together. Because mm -hmm. I think for so long, sometimes we, we fall into this trap about the communities that we intend to serve, we end up painting in sort of a monolith. This is the community where hunger is. We focus the lens on the harshness of starvation. We forget to focus the lens, the lens on the solutions that also exist in those communities. It's thinking about the smallholder farmers, the fisher folk, the young women, the women entrepreneurs, that we shouldn't think about this conversation as an abstract, that it's about communities that have actual people that have the change and the solutions within them, that we are not talking to, that we're actually doing this together, that word again. I think that when I look, about, when I look at sort of Back to your question, Sean. I know I was saying everything that I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> but uh, when I look about the things that I've sort of done, it's really about Global Citizen, the organization that I work for. It's about this creative mix of pop culture and policy. And the idea is that the conversation needs to extend beyond the room that we're in, that it can't just be the people that who already care about this issue talking about it. It needs to be the communities that experience these things, but everyday people who maybe the only thing they care about is music. How do we use the vehicles in our communities to be able to tell a story that is more than just the harshness of this reality, but to also be able to ignite some hope, to ignite change, and to think about the solutions that exist. Great, fantastic, Moanwe. You know, when I, I was in uh, South Sudan visiting one of our, our programs and we had to cross the Nile. And so we got into the motorized dugout, got across the Nile and started visiting some of the internally displaced that were in various areas. And we saw some water and agricultural projects. Well, as normally in, in trips go, we extended our stay a little longer than we should have. And we had to cross the river before um, the sunset so we could get across. And we came to the last group we were supposed to meet who had been waiting um, you know, a little too long. And, and, we, and it was a microfinance group headed by mainly women with three men members. And we went up to them and said, you know, we just need some quick information and then we're gonna have to be on our way because we're late and all and we need to really get to the boat so we can cross the Nile. And uh, a woman stood up and said, this is no way to start a meeting. And, and I looked at our, my colleagues, uh, you know, who had helped mobilize the community, and I just gave them a thumbs up because that was the success. It wasn't that we had done the microfinance. It was that the people in that village, and this woman in particular, um, had the courage to stand up and say because they knew that they were part of the solution. They needed to be um, responsible for what was going on, and it wasn't these outsiders coming in. And so. When we talk about human dignity, when we talk about subsidiarity, we have to think about how we interact every day, all the time with everyone that we interact with. And so Heber, I'd, I'd like to go to you and say, how do you see your communities and the work that you're doing, how does that radiate to other members of the community as you do your work? Oh my goodness. So first of all, my toes are dancing in my shoes after hearing <laughs> from these dynamic co-panelists here. Uh, with our work, I love the work that we do 
in black church spaces because we do start with what the institution does anyway. We're not trying to pull the church away to say, hey, here's a brand new project that's very different than what you've ever done before. As much as that might do something for my ego to show up and say, hey, I have a brand new idea, it's more effective to start with, hey, y'all are doing some amazing things already. Let's explore together and be creative on how we can connect that to this initiative because you've done so many other things before. And so, yes, we employ gospel choirs to sing church songs. We're doing Sunday school lessons. We are looking at the existing calendar of the church. And anybody who's ever grown up in any kind of religious, religious institution, food is all, always in the picture, <laughs> right? As a pastor, I know, someone dies, we eat. Someone's born, we eat. Somebody gets married, we eat. Food is always there. Our rituals, food is there. And so it took us some time to say, listen, let's just start with slowing down to pay attention to what's already happening. And let's celebrate and honor with dignity what's already happening. And let's grow from there. It started with my one church where we started growing food on the front yard of our congregation because I saw people being hospitalized over and over for diet related issues. And I did not want to go beg uh, some charitable organization. Can you come and give us the nutrient rich food that we need? Because it would cost too much in human dignity. So we took a little patch of land. In fact, it's about the size of this stage right here. And we just started growing what we needed on 1,500 square feet. And when we started pumping out 1,200 pounds of produce every season for a congregation of about 100 people, we started seeing a difference in our church. That food started coming into the sanctuary for our meals, our celebrations, and then the grapevine started working. And more and more churches started calling. And I, we I started to go around to other churches to help them start gardens, to help them buy from black farmers, and put the institutional strength of the church behind co-creating more just food system environments. Mm -hmm. What started out with my one church in 2015 is now 200 churches today. And one of the pastors in our organization said, Reverend Brown, by next year, we're going to have 2,000 churches. I said, oh, Apostle, OK, if you say so, we'll keep going. But it cuts across denominational lines. It cuts across urban, rural. Every church, think about this, and I'll, man, I don't, I don't want to keep talking now, Kate, you got me excited. <laughs> but think about this for a second. The largest collective landowner in black America is the black church. Mm -hmm. You put all the land that black churches together, across denominations, put it together. You got something to work with. And when people feel like they are a part of the solution of changing something in a way that does not cost them their dignity, and that they are in the driver's seat, and everybody's invited, but listen, I'm in the driver's seat, wait a minute. And so, and with that in mind, we're making a change, we're making a difference. I got a great story later, but I'm gonna save it for the last question. But that's the kind of ways that we are lifting up and radiating a sense of somebodiness in creating and being the solution for the challenges that we face, and inviting others who are used to leading to get in the caravan and follow. I'll finish here. Flavor Flav, raise your hand if you've ever heard the name or you know Flavor Flav. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> For those who are not initiated, Flavor Flav was a part of a group called Public Enemy back in the day, a rap group called Public Enemy. And you remember Chuck D, really serious, straight, giving you no know, substance, right? And Chuck D is rapping in the part of the group and he's dropping the bombs, like the heavy information. But then you've got Flavor Flav, big hat, big clock colorful, jumping around, and he would often say, yeah, boy! He brought the entertainment and the light lightness to the moment. I think to the donors and the bosses and the CEOs and the directors and the executives, you've been trying to be Chuck D too long. Pass the mic. You're not Chuck D now. <laughs> you are Flavor Flav. You get behind Kate. You get behind Mwandwe. And you are the one putting a puff of wind to the sails that people have already erected for themselves. And you're there to say, hey, you got to see this. You got to support this. So not the ones who are providing solutions, the ones who are cheering people on who have the answers. Thank you, Heber. You know, 
you, you remind me, we talk a lot about the three or four C's of COVID, conflict, climate, and, and all, but I like the four F's, food, family, fun, and faith. So that's <laughs> really a and nice flavor, one. Flavor, flavor, and flavor, flavor, flavor. So we got five now, so we're moving it forward. <laughs> As, as well, I think you, you bring up a key issue, and that is sometimes we keep thinking we're out to help people. No, we're not out to help people. We're out to provide a little seed so they can help themselves. Mm -hmm. Kate, could you talk a little bit about how we can help people help themselves a little more? So I wouldn't even use the word help. Yeah, you exactly. know, because yep, yep. in itself, you're saying I'm the giver and you're the receiver. Right. So. If you think of uh, just, uh, I'll go back to probably the, the work that we are doing, uh, we, we are thinking of uh, working on, we are doing a re reimagination process within Food for the Hungry and looking at really systems thinking, you know, uh, getting to, where, you know, looking at root causes and understanding, you know, you know, listening to understand is different from listening and then you tick the box and move on. So going and then saying to a community, what exactly do you need? And do we follow through and actually provide what the community needs? We do it to some extent. However, if we did that even from a local perspective where we are looking at local organizations and saying, okay, what is it that is in the way? You will find in, in situations I've been, I've, I, you know, I, every time I go to country offices, uh, FH has uh, about 20 countries and I've been there for one and a half years. I've done eight still going, so I'm feeling like I'm moving uh, to just understand, because I can't do my work without being in the community and understanding what's happening there. It's just listening to the communities and seeing how, if you have a farmer, say I'm talking to a farmer and saying, okay, so how do you do your, you know, this is great, you have a good, large farm, oh, this is wonderful. How are you working and how are you doing this? I, I did that, this recently in, in the Philippines, and I'm told, yeah, but part of the, I don't own the land, right? Mm. I don't own the land, and if I don't own the land, there is some rich person somewhere who owns most of the land, so when I produce uh, whatever food I have, I need to pay to the owner some sort of amount, right? Mm. Uh, whatever it's called, a levy or whatever it is, which is determined by the giver, the owner of the land. So that is a system that is broken. That is a system that's broken in that all the land has gone to certain people that can pay for it. Mm. So structurally, there's something wrong with that. Mm. So how do we then support that system so that a farmer is actually able to sustain their produce and take care of their, their family in the way they want, not the way we prescribe? Mm. So to your point, system the whole system, the connectedness of all this, because what we see at face value, if you don't ask those personal questions, are, are things where we think things are way, going well, but no, there's a, root, there's a problem somewhere, and this is where we have, that's what we have to start cracking. Mm. And I don't know whether any of us have time for that, but if, as long as we don't do that. Mm. We have to make time. Yeah. We have to make time. Mwamwe, we just heard about systems from Kate. Can you talk to us a little bit about the role of youth and women, because sometimes we exclude them and we say to youth, you are so powerful, you are so great, and your time will come. Mm. What I keep hearing is our time is now, mm -hmm. and you know they need to be the ones, and we shouldn't do anything without them participating. Yeah. I want to first go back to something that you mentioned, that something about the four Cs, so COVID, climate, conflict, and now we're also talking about cost of living. Um, and when you look at that, it's sort of these big challenges that have cast a shadow over these many communities, women, young people. And what we can always say is that there's always going to be another C, another challenge that comes up. And so I want to introduce another word into that conversation, which is resilience. Mm. And it's thinking about how do we have communities of women and young people to have resilience in the face of the biggest challenges. And that's the conversation that we have missed. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit of an interesting conversation I had uh, in, the last, in the last four months when we've been talking about the food crisis and said, well, if we have 820 million people who are facing hunger, I guess the solution is we need to give out 820, mi 820 million meals. And I, it seems, my mind was a little bit blown, but it seems like people f sort of reverse themselves from what this idea of solving hunger is. If you provided one meal to one person on one day, 
What does that do for them? How do you actually ensure resilience in people's lives? And in that conversation, we need to be thinking about women, young people. It shouldn't just be something that is tokenistic, that oh, for this discussion, we needed to have mentioned women and girls, we needed to have mentioned young people, otherwise the change doesn't happen. What needs to happen is that we need to invest in their resilience. Kate talked about people not owning land. When you look at the continent of Africa, we have a majority of small-scale farmers who are women. They don't own the land that they farm on. You look at the population again, and I'm referencing the continent because this is something that's close to my heart. If you look at young people, they are also a large majority of the population. They don't have the access to resources, to capital, to be able to start up anything. And so you think about this, it's this idea of if we give out the one meal, we then forget this issue that we are doing, and then we can have another conference next year where we talk about delivering meals again. But we need to be able to invest in their resilience. And at the heart of that is thinking about a conversation that brings in women, young people, and girls to the center of that, because they are the change makers in the communities that we are trying to, where we are saying we're trying to sort of find the solutions. Yeah. Exactly. No, thank you very much. I'm gonna go around and ask each of you <clears throat> if you could give us something of hope, um, because we've heard all the challenges that we're facing and where we're going, and as a change maker, you have to have hope, obviously, to change and move forward in the future. And I must say, like some of our previous speakers, I was feeling a little bit down. You know, we had the Haiti earthquake, and then we had the war, and we have the food security crisis, and I was going, what's going on? When I went out to Ethiopia and Ukraine and Ghana, I started seeing the way people were resilient and responding to these situations, and so it started giving me a little hope. And then, believe it or not, when I went to the UNGA meeting, which, you know, sometimes you think these are just meetings, I came back with uh, a, a renewed sense of hope. And the reason I did was there were Republicans and Democrats in the United States who were actually talking, recognized the needs that were about food insecurity and all, and they were talking about how can we work together on it. There were groups of, of non-governmental organizations say, there's so much need out there, we're not in competition, let's work together. How do we scale these initiatives? And then there was a general sense that we need to make sure that the local people are the genesis of where it comes, and we are behind them, they are not behind us. So Kate, would you jump in first and, and talk a little bit about some hope that you might have? Sure, and I think it's important that I do that after I asked all those questions, not that I take <laughs> them back. I think we need to keep challenging ourselves, but you know, there's, there's lots of work that everybody is um, doing, and um, we, you know, we, we are thankful that we have that. Let me just give you a, a story. I, I, in, in, sep in September, I was in the Philippines, so I um, met, I, I like to see. I, I like to sit and just chat with the team. But this time it was all of us. I, I travelled with the CEO. We were for food for the hungry, and we're talking to this man. I'll call him Pedro, uh, who is in the uh, the Philippines. And Pedro was a fisherman for years. The family, the gra grandparents, and all that. That's all they knew: water, fish, and that's how they they they, they had a livelihood. They would eat some of the fish sell and, and have a livelihood. With time, water, fish in the, in the water was dwindling. They started thinking, oh, a little bit of gardening here. What do we do? And then we all know 2013, right? There was Typhoon Haiyan. So that connection that Pedro had to water no longer is just a loss of income. It's now destroyed his equipment, bought and everything, but also killed people. So the relationship changes, right? So Pedro, this could be a sad story, but this is what happened. He, because we were part of uh, Food for the Hungry does both relief and development work. We were there during the recovery. We were talking to Pedro. I'll be quick, but I love this story. We're talking to Pedro and um, he starts talking to us about farming, vegetable gardening and all. Pedro today, not only does he have a small garden, he actually has a restaurant, which you call from food to table, doing organic farming, organic vegetables. He's linked to a contract, farm, contract, you know, contract farming to private sector. That's a system, right? Private sector who have shown him how to grow and now he's doing that and really working well. Now, COVID hit quickly. COVID hit, now he had to stop because there's no, there's no income. 
He has to, he then thinks, okay, you know what happens with communities? They always want to help others. He says, okay, let, let me do some training, uh, farming training for other, he did, now he has a training, you know, he has a training thing that's happening. When, I, when we went there, I looked at this place, it's called La Sina in Marabout. It's like a resort because now the provincial council is also building a restaurant there and it's, this is hope. This is one, this is one story of hope. Imagine if they were put to scale. That really humbled me because I thought, wow, you can do a lot with a little if you listen. Thank you. Go on way, story of hope. I'm gonna grow my hope from this room. The fact that a girl from a small town in Kavwe, Zambia, can come and sit up and have a conversation around what it means to create change. I think I want to draw my hope from that. But also, I part of this organization where we have millions of young people and everyday people who are taking action on a daily basis to call on their world leaders to create change. And that, for me, draws this sort of uh, story around we are already changing the dynamics of how we've previously told the story, that I can sit in a room where Tupac Shakar can be quoted, Chuck D can be quoted, and we can draw inspiration from that. I think that gives me hope, and we're going to solve this problem. Thank you, Mwanwe, and I think you give us a lot of hope. Well, we only have one minute left, but I figured I'd give uh, Heber the last minute because <laughs> I, I figured, one, you all want to hear his story, and number two, I know they won't shut off our mics if he's speaking. So, <laughs> Heber, go ahead. I love it, I love it. Kate's rubbing off, so I got to say a word. I start with the word, a little heavy, but you'll be okay. Racism. If we want zero hunger, we have to address racism in the food system. You gotta address sexism in the food system. And so when you talk about structures and systems, yep. we gotta name demons if you're gonna, if you're gonna fight the demon, you gotta name it. And so we're gonna name some demons that we got some work to do with if we're gonna really climb this mountain and, and really press forward. When I look at that, I think about a scripture from the Quran, leave it to the Baptist preacher to live a, a scripture from the Quran. But it's a passage that says, Allah will never change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. And that passage comes to mind. We got some work to do within ourselves if we're really gonna to come to address the issue of hunger, whether in the world or in our local community. My story is this. I was on uh, the line, I've been traveling around, I'm an evangelist, call me John the Baptist. I'm going around the country talking to black churches about food and farming and the like. And I'm down in Florida, in Jacksonville, and I'm meeting with churches there who are joining our organization. We help them to start gardens on their land and farms for those who have larger plots. And we connected them together for learning and fellowship and, and celebration. Well, down there I saw citrus. I saw lemons and oranges and bananas. And I said, oh man, wouldn't it be wonderful if we can get some of what y'all growing down here up to our communities and churches up I-95 in the north? And they said, yes, we can do that. I said, awesome. Then I went up to the north. I was in Buffalo about a month ago, and I said, Buffalo, down in Florida, they got lemons and apples and bananas. And they said, oh, we want some. And I said, well, what y'all got? Buffalo said, we got apples. I said, hmm, OK. Well, listen, if I take y'all apples down to Florida, and then I take their lemons and bring it up to Buffalo, do you think you want to do that? They said, yes. They said, let's bring the truck full both ways. Yep. We'll grow it and take it north, and then they'll grow it and bring it south. And our organization now, now I don't know how we're going to do this, but I'm a preacher. I believe in stuff happening if you just speak mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. Next year, we're going to have a truck. Mm -hmm. I don't know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to help to make that dream possible where local growers, local farmers and churches are growing what they need, and now we're just being flavor flav, connecting the dots between mm -hmm. communities that want to do this for themselves. And so that's my story of hope. I'm excited to see it. Amen. Thank you, Heeper. <laughs> <laughs> We're a minute over, but let's hear it for our panel. Heber, Kate, and Mwanwe. And as we exit, I hope all of you have a little more hope after this session, um, and then a little more hope after the two days that we can do it together. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. 
So before we take our agenda break, we have three things we need to do. Uh, first of all, we're going to do some live polling. Uh, Sarah's taught us a little bit about the importance of data. It's no AI, but you will see your polling. So if you see on your, if you're in the room, um, you'll see the QR codes on the tables. Please do join. Um, for those of you online, please go to menti.com um, and type in this code. We posted two additional questions and we'll be taking a look at the results there. Second thing, um, to our online audience around the world, uh, we thank you for your joining us. We're gonna be stopping the live stream portion of the day, but we hope you will come back at four o'clock um, to hear our keynote speaker, Yusuf Omar, who's the co-founder of Scene, talking to us a little bit about mobile storytelling. To fill your time, uh, we have put on the website two award-winning documentaries. Um, I have cried twice watching them, um, but I've also been rallied by them. So please do uh, check those out. Um, there's also a preamble by Marshall Stowell um, about the two films. For the in-person uh, audience, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for taking your COVID tests. Uh, we are greatly appreciative of that. We are going to, after lunch, go into three concurrent sessions. On the back of your badge, if those of you have actually looked at the back of your badge, um, you will see that you have some room assignments and we will be rotating you through each of those sessions um, throughout the afternoon and also tomorrow. So Dave, let's take a look at our first question. Where is there opportunity for greater collaboration in hunger and nutrition initiatives? So our first response is a common agenda. Uh, you still can fill out your poll if you're still typing. We can yeah, see. Okay, so if you have trouble, just go into menti.com. We'll be updating it throughout, and I will still take your polls. We'll be polling throughout the two days, so um, you will have a chance to maybe change these results. So um, with that, we will want to see if we can look at this data and see what the change may drive. We'll have these questions throughout the day. Um, I'll be back up later this afternoon with some more. Any other comments or questions on this? All right, well, thank you again to our online audience. Please continue to fill in the polls. We'll be seeing the results go across the two days, um, and then we'll take a break now. We are uh, convening in Skylight Pavilion for lunch for our in-person, and again, thank you to our online audience. Ladies and gentlemen, please clear the room. This program has concluded.